Hi, Hi, I'm Molly. Yeah. <laughs> I've been invited to Puma's US headquarters in Boston. We're going to watch the Boston Marathon and we're going to have the chance to interview someone really exciting. No, not this guy, but Molly Seidel, America's bronze medalist in the Olympic Marathon. But before we do, we're going to have a whirlwind tour of the headquarters, meet the CEO of a $7 billion company, as well as speak to the product engineers and the team behind all of the exciting innovations in running. Puma returned to the running market in early 2021 and actually it turns out it had taken them four years to get to the point where they thought they had products that were good enough to bring to market at that point. So shoes like the Velocity Nitro, the DV8 Nitro, the DV8 Nitro Elite, all using an entirely new proprietary foam called Nitro from Puma, which is their high-end performance foam which gives you that extra energy return. We've had the chance to talk to some amazing people today and it does give you an insight into just how long it takes to bring a product to market. The team right now are working on the 2024, even the 2025 range. We've had a sneak peek into some of the shoes that are coming out in 2023, which we can't show you, but they're really exciting, as well as some of the shoes that we're launching throughout 2022, which include some really exciting races like the Fast R or the Fast Forward. But now, over to the most important thing, which is talking to one of the best marathoners in the world, and that's Molly Seidel. ...of like people just throwing stuff at me, my signature just looked unrecognizable. So we got a bunch of questions from our audience on social, they've all mm -hmm. sent them in because people are desperate to hear from you, but actually I've got one to find out first. Mm -hmm. Tell us something that nobody knows about you. Oh, something that nobody knows about me. Um, I... A lot of people don't know, I actually studied archaeology in college, um, and so I've been on a bunch of archaeological digs, and that's what I thought my life was going to be yeah. before this whole running thing worked out. Yeah, how much are you using that degree now? The... Yeah, I have to say, <laughs> not a whole lot. Not a lot. Oh, amazing. Well, I genuinely didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump straight into some questions now that have come in from Instagram. Mm -hmm. So, it's really lovely. A lot of our audience would like to ask you some, some math and tips. Yeah. Starting off with probably the most common question we get asked on the running channel, which is what diet do you follow? What type of diet do you follow? How careful are you with what you eat? Yeah, no, I think um, I think a big thing for like training for the marathon is just getting in a lot of high quality calories. Um, I've actually tried to increase my protein intake, but yeah, I I don't follow anything like super specifically necessarily. Um, I I mostly am focused on like yeah, eat good veggies, eat get protein, get good fats. Um, but then also allow myself to have some fun with it. I don't like cut out sweets. I don't cut out alcohol yeah. by any means. I think it's kind of all about that, that keyword moderation yeah. of just knowing that you're leading a healthy lifestyle and yeah. doing what your body needs. I think your body's pretty good at telling you what it needs. So you don't cut out cheat days or whatever? Well, no, sure. I actually don't believe in the idea of a quote unquote cheat day. So yeah. It's when you want them, you have it, you don't. Exactly, yeah, I think it, yeah, paying attention to what your body wants. And if there's a day where I really want chocolate or I really want a beer, like I kind of pay attention to that. Yeah, that sounds fair enough. Mm -hmm. Is the, do you have a go-to um, treat? And also, do you have a go-to like pre-race meal? Oh, yeah, so my go-to treat actually is usually like an IPA or something, like a, a thicker, heavier beer sometimes. Nice. Um, just because I feel like it's just a, it's nice to go out, have beers with friends, celebrate that. Um, but usually I try to stick to like one really, really thick IPA. Um, and my go-to pre-race is usually some sort of fish and sweet potato I really like. But honestly, sometimes when you go to races, it's just whatever you can get the night before. I was going to ask, like, it's nice to have a plan. But mm -hmm. then I guess in a lot of your career, it's to control what you can control honestly and that's i when you compete in so many different countries it's uh you kind of vary it i've had sushi the night before races i yeah i've had um i've even had times where i just have to eat like five peanut butter and jelly sandwiches if i'm quarantined in a hotel or something but yeah you kind of just take what you can get and know that okay as long as you're getting in something relatively good you'll be fine so you don't have any superstition like oh, i have to eat this and if i can't get it it's going to be a disaster definitely not yeah, it's a dangerous track to fall in. exactly Exactly, I think it's very easy to, to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. So Run, Eat, Repeat on Instagram asks, did running come naturally to you? Yes, I think it was, even from being a kid, I was always pretty good at running and I always just loved it. Um, I would, even before I started competing, I, I loved running up in the, the woods up behind our house and it was just something that I always kind of knew, like this is the only thing I've ever wanted to do. And did you do it 
on your own for the kind of for escape or you, you mm -hmm. part of the team like which part appealed to you the most yeah no i actually started out doing it just kind of solo um i i've struggled with adhd and just being kind of the managing focus as a kid and that was one way for me to focus the the competition aspect came much later well so ADHD and focusing and then you pick the longest event mm -hmm. in, uh, in but but it's funny because I, I struggle with that but then running is how I find my focus it's my brain just immediately keys in when I'm doing that and and so I've found that it is the thing that just makes my brain work there's a lot of I suppose youngsters actually in, and people even in later life discovering maybe something like ADHD that's impacted their ability to work and focus so you say that running helped you like through school and stuff mm -hmm. so, so yeah fun. yeah so it was I was diagnosed with AD, or with OCD when I was younger it wasn't until much later in life that I got the ADHD diagnosis on top of that so okay. it kind of makes sense but um yeah it's sometimes I really kind of don't pay attention to what the the diagnosis is but I think it's just a lot of people struggle with that mm. and I just find that having something that you enjoy doing that allows you to cultivate that that stillness and focus within yourself just helps in all aspects of your life Amazing, and that mm -hmm. leads nicely into like I suppose that's how you started. But then your first ever marathon. Mm -hmm. What do you remember, and how did it feel? That first marathon was incredible, just in so many ways. I was really nervous and mostly scared for the unknown of not knowing how my body would react to the distance, how my mind would react. And the minute I got into that race, it was just this sense of flow that I've never felt before, and just knowing like, okay, this is it. Like this is my event. Wow, it almost makes me want to do a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Yeah, almost, almost, but not quite. Yeah. Um, then you see everyone like hobbling around the day after Boston. You're just like, I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah, and we're here in Boston, and yesterday, the Boston Marathon, it was a pretty tough day. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I know I've had incredibly tough days in my career, and loads of people out there, sometimes it's a tough day because you didn't quite achieve what you wanted to, or mm -hmm. you might not be able to finish, or things go wrong in the marathon, it's such a long distance. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with tough days? Yeah, it's it's definitely hard overcoming that, knowing that there were really high expectations coming in on this one. And I think it's just, I've yesterday I took some time to really like just sit with it and it, sit with the disappointment, sit with those emotions, and just realizing like, okay, like it is really about just like taking the lessons that I learned and moving on from it and not dwelling on it. Just like with a good race, you can't dwell on that forever and yeah. just sit with that. It's a uh, it's knowing that they're going to be the bad days along with the good days. And honestly, I've learned a hell of a lot more from my bad days than I have from the best days. So I think this was a really painful lesson, but a good one. And hopefully I'll be able to take this into world champs this summer. So you'd already qualified for the Olympics in Tokyo and then it was delayed for a year. Mm -hmm. And then your contract was up and it was time to, to choose a shoe partner. Mm -hmm. And you went with Puma at the beginning of 2021, the beginning of Olympic year, when obviously Nike and Adidas are pretty established with their mm -hmm super shoes did yeah. it not feel like a bit of a gamble it, it did at the time and yeah i think now looking back it's easy to say like oh yeah of course that was the right decision but at the time it was it was taking a little bit of a chance on a company that had been really strong in track and field um but hadn't been on the distance scene yet and when i was being recruited by them um they didn't have a shoe released yet they had a developmental shoe and they sent me those pairs and i was living just over here in boston and they sent me this box of shoes and I immediately put them on. I was just like, I just need something that I know that I can compete in and compete well in the Olympics in. And I tried them on and was doing strides up and down my street in Cambridge. And I was like, yeah, these are gonna work. And it was just that feeling of like, I need a shoe that I can be confident, that I can run in and run with the best in the world. And it was like, I believe in these shoes. I believe in this company. So yeah, it's a, it was really exciting to do that first race in the shoes and really show people. Like I PR'd the first time I went out in them and that was fun to get to show like, okay, th this is the real deal. Yeah, and then ultimately fast forward to Tokyo and six medalists, so three male, three female medalists in the marathon, mm -hmm. four wearing Nike shoes, one wearing Adidas shoes and then mm -hmm. you're in Puma shoes. Which, so like this, this gamble from, you know, barely nine, mm -hmm. eight, nine months earlier, mm -hmm. it, it paid off. I think it was, it was almost just more exciting being able to share that with everyone at Puma because it really did feel like we were in this together. Like I was joining onto something and everyone was so excited to show what they could do. And I just wanted to go out and literally put my best foot forward with it and show everybody what I saw in that company. And so I think that was really fun of getting to finish that marathon, throw the shoes over my shoulder and just be like, hey, like we've arrived on this scene. We've seen some of the labs here. It's really cool. A lot of the research and development figures into it. 
Um, I was speaking to you just before about the fact that right from the ground up from any shoe that Puma make, they're making a male and a female version from mm -hmm. scratch. I guess, how does... How that was happen? honestly a big reason why I, I did want to go with Puma is this female focus. And that was one of the pitches they made to me early on was like, we really want to invest in female distance running and like invest in women. And that really meant a lot to me. And I think it was just so drastically different from what I saw other companies doing that it was like, I want to support a company that is invested in women. And so it's been, it's been really cool to see that and see them cultivating that as women's distance running, especially in the US has gained such traction and is having such a moment right now. It feels like Puma's really on the forefront of that. Harris on Instagram asks, do you race specific long runs? So I'm going to take that to mean, do you take long, do you treat long runs in different ways for the marathon running at marathon? Yeah, no, definitely. There are certain long runs that we take them more as like an easy recovery. And there are certain long runs that we really do hit it hard or add elements of a five mile tempo in there or progressive long run, just because you have a lot of miles to work with and a lot of things you can do with the long run. I see it as a really critical part of training. It's kind of related through mm -hmm. training. Um, Vanessa asks, which training sessions to you are non-negotiable? Like which workouts in, in the week or the, the months? Mm -hmm. Long tempos are definitely non-negotiable. It's a huge source of strength for me. And as well, doing some sort of speedier intervals at race pace or goal race pace. We'll do mile repeats, two mile repeats, just to get that feel in your legs. And it gives me that confidence that I can run with that pace when it goes out in a marathon. Should you train in your super shoes and in the carbon plated shoes mm -hmm. or should you save them for race day? What do you think about that? So I train in my carbon plated shoes. I think it's really important because I think you do run differently in the carbon plated shoes. Honestly, I run um, a lot more efficiently when yeah. I'm in the carbon plated shoes. And so I think as, as long as I've been racing marathons, that's what I've done. I've found it very important, not just leaving it for race day yeah. and being able to let your body adapt to what that is going to be. And yeah, I think it's just good getting in that practice in race mode. Yeah. It's just like getting, going through in your warm up how you would in a race. If you're practicing how you race, I think that's very important. Yeah. So that because you physically move differently in them, you can't just save them to get the benefit on race. Exactly, yeah, because you're going to not have that practice necessarily in the same mode that you're going to be racing in. So I think it's very important for your key big sessions and workouts to be able to put on your race shoes and say, okay, this is how I'm going to feel in the race, let's practice this. Okay, so do you have one piece of parting advice to our audience if they were taking on any distance from 5K, their first ever 5K up to their first ever marathon. Like, mm -hmm. is there something that you've, you know, that you've hold, held in your head that someone's ever said to you or that you'd like to give them? Yeah, uh, I think probably the most important thing for me is keeping running in perspective and remembering that no matter what the race is, no matter how good a day is or how bad a day is, at the end of the day, it's just running. It's not that complicated. And being able to know that you can go as hard as you want and really push yourself to the edge but your family's still gonna love you. Your friends are still gonna love you no matter how you do. I think it keeps that perspective of like, okay, I do this to have fun yeah. and that's what it's about. Yeah, keep it in perspective and in perspective, good luck in the World Championships. This Thank year, this you. Year. Thanks, I'm pumped to represent Team USA. Hopefully nice. we'll see you guys in Eugene. Hey, I'd love to be there. Mm -hmm.